All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I think I heard Stephanie Miller doing some kind of introductory comment. Is that right? Yep. All right. How was the first workshop? Some people want to put some comments in the chat real quick. Those that are virtual. All right, you can do that at your leisure. Um, I'm gonna formally introduce our keynote speaker. It's very exciting, Mary Dillon, in just a second. But first, I just wanna lay out the structure of this conversation. We're gonna talk, Mary and I are gonna talk for about 30 minutes. And then I'm gonna, then I am going to go out to the audience, the audience both being virtual and the audience that's physically at 1871. And my colleagues at 1871 will help facilitate the Q&A um, happening in the auditorium. And we'll do that for maybe about 15 minutes or so, and then it'll come back to me for the final question. This is an opportunity. You have, you have this opportunity to engage with this phenomenal leader. So, and I know that she is open to your, your Q and A and your dialogue. So please do not be shy. Take advantage of this, of this opportunity. All right. So um, let me introduce uh, Mary Dillon. Mary is a Chicago native and business executive with more than 35 years of experience leading consumer driven businesses in a diverse range of industries from consumer packaged goods to restaurants, to telecom, to beauty and retail. She currently serves as executive chair of the Alta Beauty Board of Directors, following her successful eight-year run as the company's chief executive officer. During her tenure as CEO, Mary and her team tripled Alta Beauty's market cap, doubled revenues, and transformed the company to become a leading Fortune 500 retailer. In my opening re remarks, you guys remember the, the stats I gave about teams led by women, teams uh, with, with diverse uh, leaderships. This is testament to that. This is proof of that under Mary's leadership. She also evolved the company's board of directors to become one of the most gender diverse of any large public company in the nation and championed the establishment of the Ulta Beauty Charitable Foundation to support women and families. Mary also serves on the board of directors for Starbucks, KKR, and Daily Harvest, and is the current chair of the Economic Club of Chicago. She earned her bachelor's degree in marketing and Asian studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Mary and her husband, Terry, are proud parents to four adult children. And as an additional fun fact, it turns out that one of 1871's board members crowned Mary homecoming queen in high school. <laughs> And I believe, if I understand the story, that you also, in turn, crowned him. Oh, you know, this Steph must be Mike Lyman must be on your board. Mike Lyman, yeah. Go Hinsdale South Hornets, okay. <laughs> it's Mike Lyman. It's Mike Lyman. The world keeps getting smaller, right? Yeah. The yeah. So there's so much to talk about, so much to learn from you, and sadly, so little time. But thank you, Mary, for being here. We are, we are grateful, and we are um, excited to learn. Hey, and happy International Women's Day. And I'm worth being festive to celebrate. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, awesome. So let's let's jump in. Um, let's do a a quick map of your personal journey. You've had several big, you know, big big roles, big pivots in your career. Can you walk us through your journey to becoming CEO of of Alta? Well, yeah. How much time do we have? Right. It's been a long <laughs> time. Uh, you know, I'd start with the fact that it's. You know, I'm sure maybe I know I'm not alone in this, but no, I, I didn't have the kind of journey plotted out and nor would I have ever expected, you know, early in my life to, to be able to create this kind of career. And, and um, you know, coming from a family where I'm a first generation college graduate, I didn't know anybody in business really until I started my business career, like zero. And so I just knew that I, I had a lot of ambition, which is, by the way, a word I want to reclaim for women to use proudly because often it's used frankly against us I think uh, but to, you know not everybody has the kind of ambitions I guess to want to be a CEO but you know I realized early on that I just 
had a lot of drive and energy to think about how to lead businesses and lead teams. And really, I got excited about it from my undergraduate degree. I took a marketing class, and that was the first was studying business and you just said Asian, Asian studies. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but the marketing class and the consumer insights classes were the ones that really helped me understand how excited I was about the sort of the art and science of this kind of work. So anyways, but I was very fortunate to start my first professional job out of college at um, at Quaker Oats, which then was its own independent company headquartered here in Chicago, uh, headquarters in the Merchandise Mart uh, yeah. way back in 1984. And, you know, I was very lucky and I mean, I was aggressive and lucky at the same time to get that job. I'll explain why we can talk about that later. But it really set me on a course because I got into a brand management training program where I learned how much I love to lead consumer businesses. How I, I learned how much I love to be part of a cross-functional team and then over time leading cross-functional teams. So I would say that part of my career really set me up for a lot. Right. So I was there for I think it was 15 years, you know, as everywhere, starting from a marketing associate to the president of the Quaker Foods division. Um, we were purchased by PepsiCo in 2000, and I stayed there and became president of that. And so I got to the benefit of two great CPG companies, Quaker and Pepsi. And then after a while, I really knew that I wanted to do get some international experience. Mm -hmm. And I was also raising my family at the time. My husband and I both are here from Chicago, in Chicago, grew up in Chicago, have large extended families. So I didn't really want to have to move. So I ended up moving companies. And that's the great thing about Chicago. There's so many headquarters here. But I then went to McDonald's to be the global head of marketing. And that gave me a great perch to get great international experience and learn a really different industry. Um, and I did that for five years. And it was, you know, uh, really hard in some ways and very different than the companies I had been in before. I learned a lot. I feel like my biggest accomplishment was really getting the Happy Meal globally to be a much more helpful offering. And that was important, I think. Um, right. But I knew at some point that I really missed running a P&L. So I, I, after a while, got anxious to do that. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to be the CEO of US Cellular, which I did for three years and actually realized that as great of a company as it is, when I learned about the opportunity at Ulta Beauty, it felt like the right thing to do because it would bring together all of the things I've learned how to do. And I, and I could really drive growth in the company. So that was kind of the trajectory. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. And I, I like the the underscoring of the word, using the word ambition proudly. And I think also the, you didn't necessarily know that you wanted to be the CEO of a major company when you started out, right? These are, these are yeah, well, things no, that- Yeah, well, no, I mean, I never, I never, I, even, I, never even seemed possible. But I think what right, I saw right. is that I continued to look ahead in my business career. So if I was, the first job is to do great at your current assignment. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. can't, continue to grow and get more responsibility if you don't really focus on delivering against your short-term goals. But I also um, would kind of observe how people operated at levels above, both good and bad, and learn from yeah. that. But I think my confidence grew over time that, you know, as I saw how much I love leading people in, in bigger organizations, it was applying the same skills at different levels and trying to bolster my confidence and have the support of others that, that I could do that. So I think over time is where that ambition to be, ultimately think I could run a company happened. It was probably not until my 40s that I really thought that was possible. Yeah. Yeah. Same with me, by the way, although very different circumstances, but yeah. we're going to come back to people who helped you in just a minute. You've had this in, this outstanding run as the CEO of Ulta. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your, your, you know, the keys to success there, yeah. your key to growth at Ulta? Yeah. I'm so, so proud. I mean, as you can imagine, I, I would say two things. One is that I didn't create Ulta. I didn't, I didn't create the company and the company is now over 30 years old. But I, it had great foundation. And I also really, I think, developed and put together a world-class team that are now continuing to run it in a world-class way. Yeah. So it wasn't just like me. I mean, I'll start with that. Uh, but what I saw with Ulta is a, a kind of a diamond in the rough. I mean, frankly, when I first was um, talking to the company, the board, I didn't really know much about the company. Even I didn't even know it was headquartered in Chicago. I hadn't really shopped at Ulta that much. And, you know, in fact, a lot of people were calling it Ultra at the time. You know, no, everybody got the name wrong. But Ulta Beauty, uh, I saw that, again, I felt like, well, this is a great concept. It has great foundation. It's based in excellent, um, you know, assortment of merchandise from mass to prestige. 
We had services in every store, which is great. And we had great real estate strategy, but we didn't really have a cohesive consumer strategy nor a cohesive even brand. You know, what does Ulta Beauty stand for? So, you know, to me, it's what I really did was kind of build on where we were, but to really, um, I guess, turbocharge growth through a consumer lens. And again, I, I'd say the team, you know, now Dave Kimball is the CEO of the company and he's worked with me twice before. And we have a similar kind of background and training. And he was one of the first, the like, first person I asked to come help me was our head of HR, Jeff Childs. The people side of our business is so important. And then Dave really helped them to create that demand engine. So I'd say we focused on back, back to my roots, deep consumer insight, you know, rather than just, um, again, I don't mean to sound critical, but a lot of retailers sort of were structured in a way that it was like all about the merchandising. So what products are you going to get? And yeah. then how do you then create demand and pricing for those products? Growing up in the CPG world, we always looked at everything through the lens of who's the consumer? How mm -hmm. big is the market? What are their current needs? Um, what are their future unmet needs? Who do you compete with? That kind of classic you know, consumer category competition framework. We didn't really have that at Ulta so much. It was more like a demographic description. So that's it yep. really started with deep understanding of the market, where we played in the market, how we differentiated, and then building all of our strategies to around that. And that, I mean, in a nutshell, I'd say that was job one. And then job two, equally important, was to create a culture where, I mean, listen, the vast majority of our sales happen in our stores still today, even though e-commerce yep. is the fastest growing channel, you know, 75, 80% of the sales, and back then even more so, or more like 90% of the sales were in our stores. And it's very clear that our associates in the stores are the ones that are going to know best, frankly, what's working and what's not. And, you know, having grown up doing every part-time job possible, including working at Osco Drugstore, you know, in the, in the beauty department, putting CoverGirl on the JPEGs, you know, I knew that if we could take what would be a great, I think, consumer growth strategy, but combine it with creating kind of my dream is put together a culture that I could really influence, one of real collaboration, one of real respect, results orientation. So we really, I think, worked hard and continue every day to put our store associates kind of the center of everything we do, and more importantly, listen to their ideas, show respect. And that created a flywheel of, I mean, right now, we our engagement scores are in the top 10% of retail. And I wow. think, our, and we know that we hear from our customers how great they feel shopping in an Ulta Beauty store. Quite often, it's because of the way our associates interact with them. So I'd say an understanding of a consumer strategy and implementing that, plus creating a culture created, I think, the momentum together that has brought us where we are and continues, you know, company continues to do great. Yeah, phenomenal. There's a comment in the chat that the fact that 70% of your sales are actually still in the store in this current Mm -hmm. Environment is you got a, a like a claps a shout out for that from yeah well certainly you know during the pandemic we had to close our stores and of thankfully course. you know we had a strong e commerce channel and team and our distribution centers you know the teams there you know we we were able to keep them open and keep running and service our guests that way but yeah to your point once we opened up stores again traffic and consumers really came back and so I think again I could go off for hours on this one but yeah. anybody who thinks that you know retail is gonna is never you know, brick and mortar retail is dead. You know, it's not true. It depends on the category and you need to have, you know, we focus on the beauty enthusiast, which is a shopper who loves beauty, right? They love right. to try new things. They love experiences and we need to match that. But we also need to be where they're shopping anytime, anytime they're on the beauty journey, right? So you, the, the term omnichannel maybe is a little overused, but that's the way we think about it as well, yeah. omnipresent. Is the art behind you a total tangent, but is the art behind you part of your collection from your time at Ulta? Are you in, you're in your office? I'm in, I'm in my home office, yeah. So when I had to start working from home, I decided to try to make my office feel like my, you know, my work office. So I have yeah. Ulta items here, yes. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So now you made this shift from a year ago, right, from CEO to chair. And I guess the core question I have about that is how do you, and this is an organization that you gave everything to for eight years as the CEO and you know, rebuilt the team and define the consumer strategies you just talked about and right all of that stuff and now you've transitioned to this different yeah. role where you're no longer in charge of the details right can you talk yeah. about how, about that journey and how you prepared for it and like what's hard about that yeah i mean you know this was a choice that i made along with the board to mm -hmm. say you know listen i i love the company and i could run it for many more years but i also have 
had and still have a generation of leaders that were really ready to step in. So David, CEO, and Keisha Steelman, we appointed as chief operating officer, a role that we didn't have before. Um, and it was very clear that we had the talent in the organization of the next generation of leaders, right? So, so one of the most important things for board of directors is to work on CEO succession. And uh, and we did. Sorry, I just realized I got to plug my my laptop in. All of a sudden, it's looking like I was like, "What the heck? We can't have that happen." Um, so, anyways, the uh, so the plan. You know, we had the plan in place for a while, and so the idea of becoming executive chair is one that's you know pretty common right now in a lot of companies. That you know, if it's an open plan transition, there's some pluses to the continuity of having the CEO stay on, but only for one year. Because on the other hand, you don't want the old CEO around forever, right? So it's kind of like, it's just a nice transition that we've been able to do. And, you know, for me, I have other things that I've been focused on as well. And I don't miss doing like the quarterly earnings calls and all that. Uh, even, even in a great quarter, it takes a lot of work to get ready for that. And, you know, I have a great relationship with Dave and the board. So so it's a kind of a, a good balance, right? It's, it took a, a little, maybe a month or so. It felt very odd to be like not in that cadence yeah. of the normal ways of working. But also in some ways, given that we've all been, you know, working differently anyways, the last couple of years, maybe in some ways made it easier. But, you know, I'm happy and proud to be able to contribute to the, to the company at the exec chair level. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm going to my observation outside in about about your professional life right now is one that I that I characterize as a portfolio approach. Yeah. I don't know if that, if that resonates with you or not, but just this idea that. You're executive chair, certainly, but you're you serve on the board of several mm -hmm. others, as I mentioned, and a civic leader. And how, it, how does that feel to be? I mean, would you would you agree that it's sort of this portfolio yeah. of things you're spending? Yeah, your time? I mean, for right now, that's exactly what it is. And I've really just been taking time to think about, you know, how do I want to spend the next chapter of my life? It's not, yeah. you know, like I I didn't leave Alta Beauty with a plan to go do X, Y, or Z, right? Sure. I really wanted to step back and think about. So it is, I guess I'd say the the boards that I'm on, so Starbucks and KKR, I've been on those boards for a while. So that wasn't a new addition. Um, and but daily, but what I have done is said, okay, I want to like stay involved in the business world and I want to um, you know, my 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 origins were in food, right? So that's what we talked about. So I found myself attracted to getting involved in a few food companies in different ways. So, um, you know, one um, one company I've just connected with and done a little bit advising is a company that's in the food waste space. They're, they're headquartered in Denmark and they're called Too Good To Go. And that's an okay. interesting concept. Daily Harvest is a more yeah. established business that is um, with a female founder and very much about, it's a direct to consumer, highly, you know, sustainable. On the, on the, in the I'm audience. sure. Well, I learned about it through the millennials in my life during the pandemic, but I've been attracted to say, how can I get involved with founders doing really good things that are good for the planet and good for people that I can also learn what it's like to work in a company or help people at that stage of company? Because my whole career has been with these big Fortune 500 companies. So it's interesting. But I recently, um, I haven't like announced this yet, but there's a really cool uh, concept that I'm getting involved with. And it's called Tradish. It's oh a TRE dish. And it's a founder in Canada that's creating what I would call a very innovative platform around the home food sharing economy. And this is about, you know, for, for, uh, for all of time, I, you know, people, women in particular have been cooking meals in their homes often for their bigger families or sometimes neighbors. There's definitely a market where people are making a living by selling food that they make out of their homes. So Peter Wang, who's the, uh, the founders created a a way, a platform that is going to, and it's, they're testing it, they're doing it right now in Southern California, launching in Canada and then the rest of the U.S. to help people who want to be entrepreneurs, but don't have the money to go, you know, pay the overhead for a restaurant space. People that have lost jobs during the pandemic, people, women that, you know, maybe want to make a living. But So it's so cool to be able to take this industry and really professionalize it and give people tools to bring it to the next level. So point is, these are the things that are interesting and fun for me to focus on right now. So. Yeah, that's great. My guess is that the demands on that there are there are more people asking you to participate in things, including me asking you to you know come in here, speaking engagements, advisory yeah. roles, board roles. How do you think about um, how do, how do you, what, like what's your framework of determining what's important to you and what you say yes to and what you say no to? Because I, I have a feeling that there are a lot of people in the audience here who 
who at times feel overwhelmed by the number of, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the feeling of obligation to say yes and be helpful. Like, what's your intention? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, it's kind of like my kids are like, wait, are you retired? You seem busier than ever. So, you know, I, I guess there's a few things, but but largely, Betsy, really, if it's especially, you know, my heart is in the Chicago business community and my whole career, I think I've worked hard to elevate people who need an elevation, right? Who maybe don't have the built-in advantages or networks. And so it tends to be if people are asking me to do things that are supported, particularly, I mean, International Women's Day, right? You know, any ways that I can be helpful to, you know, women or, you know, historically underrepresented folks that, you know, or people that come from my kind of background, which is not having, you know, a a big legacy of people in uh, business in their lives, right? How to navigate those things. So those are the type of things that it's hard for me to say no to, but you're right. I do have to manage my time. You know, there's plenty of times that I'm doing just individual one-off mentoring calls with people, you know, whether it's uh, now that my kids are adults, some of their friends are in the work world. I have a ton of nieces and nephews. So, so in that all the way up through, you know, people throughout my professional career that, you know, I'm, I'm very, it's, it's exciting to be able to help coach people, whether it's somebody joining a board for the first time and how to think about that. So no formal kind of coaching stuff, but more just trying to be helpful where I can. The other topic I would say, and, and I, I, you may want to go more into this, but, you know, I have now four adult kids that range from 23 to 32. And this notion of how do people do this, have a career and have a family, and the questions about that, particularly for women. You know, five, six years ago, I might have said, I'm tired of talking about this. Why do people keep asking me? Why are they only asking women? Why do they make us feel right. guilty? Right. All this stuff. Well, then I had an epiphany. I was like, well, because it's still an issue. That's why people are asking. They're still trying to figure it out, you know, uh, women and men alike. And so that's a topic that I'm really happy to talk to help people kind of think about. There's no one size fits all answer, but if I can help people who are trying to navigate some of these tougher times in their careers, think about the long game and how to get there. Yeah. You know, I'm, I like to do that as well. Yeah. I think that's terrific. And this sort of notion that you're sending the elevator back down or you're, you're trying, you know, yeah. you're trying to pull other people up. When you think about when you were rising up, who, how, who helped you, right? Are there a handful of people that you say, but for, these people yeah. or these experiences, I wouldn't be where I am today? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I would say my instincts all along in my career was that I knew that I needed, I never felt like I had all the answers or could do it all on my own, right? And that's kind of a helpful, it's helpful to go in with humility, but you have to balance it with drive and passion and ambition too, right? Because you can't, so it's a balancing act. So I, But I would say that I think I had a pretty good intuition about how to reach out to get the support it needed without looking like I was being too political. I mean, that's the tricky thing is that like, especially in big organizations, you have to be seen and heard. You have to you have to deliver the results, as I said earlier. But if you want to drive your career, you also have to find places that people can see you maybe operating a level or two above where you are today. Yeah. And that's a fine line because it can also then look like, oh, somebody's just being political and try, right? So a yeah. phrase I haven't used for a long time, but you, you know what I mean. So yeah. What I would do was, you know, I remember one of the first bosses that second boss that I had at Quaker, you know, I I was trying to figure out, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was trying to figure it all out. But he uh, for my performance review, we would write a self-assessment and whatnot. And he wanted he indicated that I was probably going to get the top rating. Like he was uh, the results I had that you were really good. So write your performance assessment. So I did. And he gave it back to me and he's like, the self-assessment is fine, but where's the stuff that you need to work on? Where's the stuff that didn't go well? And honestly, it was freeing because I didn't know that you could be open about the fact that, yes, you might have had a year where you're an A plus, but you still have things that aren't you need to develop. And I know that sounds kind of basic, but I still found myself teaching that to people later in my career to say, it's fine. Like, I don't expect you to have 100% of everything. You just need to be aware and working or compensating for those things, right? So so he was a great influence. I worked- um, Right, my, listen, right. Because I, I think a lot of people, they don't want to admit that there might be a flaw, even though, as you well, point out, we're all constantly- yeah. So it really was, was really helpful, you know, and I still use that lesson. And then, you know, at Quaker, there were a lot of women in senior positions when I started there back in the 80s. So I didn't really- perceived that being a woman was going to make it doubly hard, at least in that time, in that place, 
it was pretty cool. And so I had a lot of women bosses, but Margaret Stender and I became very good friends. And she was a, another great both kind of coach and helped me see where I could get better. And then we became really good friends. You know, later in my career, as I started to get on boards, you, know, you meet a lot of really interesting people. And, you know, like when I was thinking about taking the role at uh, U.S. Cellular, yeah. I knew somebody named Saul Trujillo from the Target board, who was a you know, and a wireless executive with a lot of experience and accomplishment. So, you know, I find that you can pick up the phone and call people and and get and, and get a lot of good advice. You know, Anne Mulcahy is a former CEO of Xerox. She's somebody I still tap into all the time. So I think you find that there's just lots of people out there that are super willing to be helpful and just want to be asked. Well, and I think that it's so that's because I have some my stories of my own of reaching out and some people that we have in common, like Sally Blount, like don't know her, but you know, sent her an email and she responded, right? Like that concept of just reaching out and asking, if you don't do it, you don't know if they're like, the worst thing that's going to happen is they don't answer. And the second worst thing is they say, I can't help you. But more often than not, they're going to try yes. to be helpful. But so many people are, are afraid to take, do that first reach out. Yeah, exactly. But but it's also like kind of finding people that are maybe naturally in your network that you can yes. tap into as well. Sure. That helps, you know, versus completely out of the blue. Totally, but, yeah. but I, you know, I really do try to be uh, pay that back and be helpful to other people as well. Yeah. Awesome. There's the number of questions in the chat is trying to grow. So I'm going to we're going to shift there and then we'll come back to me um, uh, to close us off in about 20 minutes or so. So um, I'm going to do. Uh, we'll do one from the virtual side and then we'll bounce out into the uh -huh. audience. And I think Stephanie Miller or Lisa Laws from my team will help us in the audience. But let's start with let's start with um, Dory. Let's start with your question in the chat here. Um, this is as you help the Happy Meal to be more healthy in the fast food industry. Are you aware of or engaged in any efforts to make the concept of beauty more inclusive and empowering? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Dory, for asking that question. Um, I'm surprised I haven't hit on that yet. I would say that one of the things I'm most proud of at Ulta Beauty is that we are attempting to lead the charge in this in this in this area. To really, I mean, if there's anything that should be inclusive, it's it's as a category, it's beauty, right? Because beauty is very physical, it's very emotional, but it's very much based on kind of who you are and who you want to be, right? So skin color, hair texture. I mean, these are, you know, us as humans, right? And then how do we want to express ourselves? And so, but I did find that when I, um, you know, eight, nine years ago, I was shocked at kind of how non-inclusive the category of beauty was. I didn't really know. I hadn't really looked at it until, you know, I remember we were about to open up a store in Hyde Park and it was within the first six months or so of me starting at Ulta Beauty. And I was really excited and thought, oh, this would be a great thing. Maybe we do a press event. And I go to the store a few days before we open and every picture in the window was a blonde Caucasian woman. I mean, with all due respect, my one of my daughters is a blonde Caucasian, but but I was like, well, that that's I, that was us. Like I didn't even realize that we were in a cycle with this industry of not representing diversity, mm -hmm. right? And that just kind of became a mission for me. And so right now we've really flipped, I think, into A, we've got a, a big commitment in terms of um BIPOC founders, not only launching brands of which we've done many, many, but also investing in the brands in terms of marketing and advertising. And then from as it relates to our marketing images and our messages, it's all about inclusive, inclusivity on every level from age, race, gender, gender identity, and reflecting our, you know, the way the world is going as well as our own associates. Um, and then of course, you know, our board is is really quite diverse right now. It's 60% women and we have two black directors and two new directors that are Latinx. Um, and our leadership team is diverse and you know getting more so. So, but to me, it's like we have a real responsibility here. And so I'm proud of what the team has done. A lot more to come, but I thank you for asking about that. Yeah, great. All right. Um, I'm not sure who on the team is managing it on the on the in the space side, but does somebody have a question in the live audience? Um, yes. Um, I just want to know if you could talk a little bit about work-life balance. Um, I know when you work with these majors, you said you were raising your family, um, and you've gone through different phases, obviously. But could you talk about a little bit about work-life balance? It, it was a little hard to hear, but Betsy, I think the question was about work-life balance, correct? Yes. And then I, there was something about uh, raising a family. 
Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of an age old, as I said, it's a bigger age old conundrum and I think it's not getting easier. Um, and one of the things I would say is it's kind of like, uh, it's such a personal set of decisions, right? It's all about your values. And so one of the things I try to not do is impose my framework and decisions on anybody else because it's not, it's, it just worked for us. So, but stepping back, what, one of the key things for us is that, um, you know, my husband and I got married when I, we were pretty young. And so we've been married 37 years. We met in college and we didn't, either one of us have a program in our mind of where our lives exactly were going to go. You know, maybe, maybe that was kind of freeing in some ways. There wasn't like deep expectations about his career, my career, his role, my role. So the first few years, I'd say we were just kind of, you know, both working and figuring it out. But when I was pregnant with my first child, Jack, you know, I really did want to be able to have a balance of maybe working part time and, 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 and being home. And at that point, um, you know, I was a brand manager at Quaker. And so if I wanted to go part time and Quaker was pretty ahead of the curve on a lot of the stuff I call remote work telecommuting. That's all we have was phones back then. But, you know, they were pretty open to things. And but I knew I would need to if I wanted to go part time, be maybe in a new products or strategy type role, which wasn't what I loved and also would take me off the track of being a general manager kind of getting to that next level of director of marketing or vice president of marketing. So anyways, the point is, I created with another woman a job sharing arrangement and we pitched it, uh, we got it approved and we did this for a couple of years where we were um, sharing a job as brand managers. And that was you know, over 30 years ago. So I give the people back then who are willing to give that a try a lot of credit. And then I would say then at that point, um, after a while, I was I was uh, up for a promotion. We, my job sharing partner had to move to another state at some point because of her husband's job. So anyways, I was still doing it part time. But then I was up for a promotion to director of marketing. And that job would have to be full time. And that at that point is when we decided that to have my husband try staying home for a year. So Terry was in very different fields. He's a biochemist. He was working at Abbott Labs. He liked his job, but he didn't love it the way that I love my work. And we thought we'd give this a try. And you know, many years later, it continued. We had, you know, three more kids after that. And, and he was the man in, in charge. So so I would say for us, that's a model that works. It wouldn't necessarily work for everybody. Um, I think the hardest thing is being a single parent. I think the second hardest thing is having dual careers because it's a lot, but it's all possible. And, and I'd say at some point as my kids got older, I will, first of all, I would always try also to minimize the impact on them if, as much as I could about how much I had to work because I had, you know, jobs that required a lot. So I would, you know, be home for dinner. I would just create my own rules. You know, even if the informal workplace was people stayed till six or seven at night, I wasn't going to do that. I would leave, I'd go home, I, you know, have dinner with my family. And then I would often fire up the laptop for a couple hours, right? After they were in bed, I was willing to do that. And then to them, as they got older, I think, what they share with me is they never felt like I was, you know, not around, right? They kind of felt like this was just our life and, and what we did. So I tried to find ways to integrate them. As my kids got older, I also was able to take each of them individually sometimes with me on trips or to big meetings where they could see me present or meet people I worked with. And that was kind of cool too, as they kind of got to see the world that I was in when I wasn't home. So long with that answer to your question, but you know, I think anything is possible, but not easy. I mean, the, those years back in my 30s and early 40s are a bit of a blur. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I think uh, my own, I have a nine-year-old and um, I sometimes refer to him as the 1871 mascot because I just have to have him. He just has to come to work with me sometimes. You know I mean? It's just what it is, right? I don't have any other right. choices. Well, and in my opinion, I mean, I think that, and again, I, I think the one of the upsides, I guess, of, of this, you know, COVID situation has been that the hybrid work and the ability to integrate work and life became a mandate overnight everywhere. And I know everybody's in different places of figuring out how they want to go forward, but I think there's no question that flexibility uh, is obviously is being required by younger people in the workforce. And I think um, companies have seen what's possible when you create that flexibility as well. Yeah. So let's go into the virtual chat there. Um, you, you've talked about the theme of diversity already in this conversation, but there's a, a woman, Laura Matthews, who is building a hiring app. So she's, she's a founder. And her question is, what challenge do you face now with getting great associates and with addressing diversity in both staffing and, and, you know, product offerings or product development? 
since obviously all genders and all all backgrounds use beauty products. Yeah. Well, I also see at the end of your comment there, Laura, that DEI requires a top-down momentum. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I mean, at the end of the day, if it is not coming from the top of the company, that diversity, inclusion, and equity matter, it's not going to happen. And so, I mean, for me, it started with several years ago, like I said, my own personal recognition that we weren't doing enough as a company, as an industry, to understand and represent the diversity of our country. And so because I made that such a mandate, and it's not like people weren't trying. I think we just weren't trying hard enough. I don't think we really saw and were moving with the momentum that we needed. Um, even things like understanding gender pronouns. You know, I, I remember bringing that up several years ago to my team because one of the things I do is really listen hard to young people. I really understand where young people's mindsets are. And so things are changing rapidly and we needed to do some catch up. But I would say if Ulta Beauty today, I mean, I'm proud. We have a diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, mandate at the top that Dave leads. We have an external advisory board, Tracy Ellis Ross, who, who founded the, the company. Uh, well, you know her as an actress and an activist. And she also founded a brand called Pattern that she launched exclusively with us. She's an advisor to us. And we have a team focused on all aspects of, to your point, you know, whether it's hiring at the entry level, whether it's how we think about every job throughout the company, how we represent in the marketplace um, in all aspects of our business. So like all businesses, you know, we're, we're not where we exactly need to be. I think we're great from a gender diversity perspective. I mean, that one's kind of, it's great that we get credit for it, but you know, it's, it's sort of an industry based thing. We have, I don't know if it's 38,000 or so employees right now and 92% are women. So that's great. And, but, and we were getting a lot of kudos for that. And I realized we cannot obviously rest on our laurels. That's not enough. We need a lot more um, diversity of all races and ethnicities in our company, because again, we're trying to represent the entire country that we live in. So, you know, hiring today, I think we're doing a pretty good job at, at people who want to be in retail. You know, there's a lot of momentum towards our company, but you know, as everybody here, I'm sure knows that it's a, it's a challenging time and in terms of hiring and retention. And, and we're not, you know, we're not alone in that. Right. Great. Thank you, Mary. All yeah. right, audience in uh, in the auditorium. Hi, ladies, my name is Lisa. Um, my question for both Mary and Betsy is post COVID, there is obvious disruption to every vertical, every industry out there today. We talked a little bit about, you know, the advantages that play to mothers in the work-life home, talked about advantages like today's event, <laughs> the hybrid solution. What other strategies or themes do you see emerging from this disruption and what do you think we should be looking toward? Yeah, oh, such a great question. Um, well, I mean, I'd start with kind of where you were going, which is the hybrid, the ability, I'd call it hybrid life. You know, and I think going forward, it will always be incumbent on us as leaders and employers to understand that, that there's value to that. And, and, and we need to figure out what's the best way to find that intersection between you know, what you need as a company. And I do believe that some in-person together work is absolutely critical, but then where can you also understand that you're actually gonna have people be more excited about staying with your company if you provide them some kind of flexibility. You know, childcare is another, I mean, we, again, that to me is so important that, I mean, as a country that we try to get this more resolved in terms of, you know, shortages of affordable childcare and that, you know, especially with the disruption of kids in school, out of school, people are home, they're not home, right? So that's going to be an important topic. Um, but I think going forward that, you know, the expectation of the future workforce is going to be not only our companies really leading through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, but that we help people live the lives that they want to live in different ways, you know what I mean? And provide, meet people where they are, but it, it's kind of a two-way street, you know what I mean? Right now, I think there's a lot of more, the pendulum is kind of swinging in, in favor of the workforce, right? In terms of demands, but that's good to, I mean, we need to be aware of what are what's meaningful to people, you know, that maybe we thought was, we didn't realize was as meaningful as it will be in the future. So um, certainly I'd say any industry like for retail, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, being a great physical and digital company is is there's no going back. I mean, it's kind of obvious that's been momentum, but it was accelerated dramatically. So understanding how you can provide 
you know, same day solutions, you know, picking buy and line, pick up and store, delivery, great e-com service, as well as a compelling reason for somebody to go to the store so that the bar is up there. You know, certainly travel and hospitality, there's tremendous, you know, headwinds or, or tailwinds that are going to come as people have money to spend and they've been cooped up. But how you think about creating those environments, it's just more about, about pleasure travel than business travel, right? Because that's going to take longer to come back. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing I would just say is, you know, mental health and, and the stress. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert here, but I certainly recognize and we do as a company that providing a space to talk about tough topics, also providing you know benefits for people in the mental health space, being transparent about current events, giving people forums to talk about things that are on their minds that are happening is more important than ever. And, you know, we used to, I think, in the early part of my career, it felt like a real separation of what you could talk about at work and what you couldn't, if that makes sense. But I'll, I remember that when George Floyd was murdered, I remember on a over that weekend, and I remember we had a, a town hall meeting coming later in the week, and I talked to my team on that Tuesday, it was after Memorial Day, and I, I said, I want to put a slide in to the deck and talk about George Floyd. And at that point, I would say it was still not even everybody was really aware of what had happened in Minneapolis. And my instinct was, this is going to be on our employees' mind. It was just the beginning, obviously. It's, it, it's not certainly the first or the last time it, that kind of tragedy is happening or has happened. But frankly, I think one of the legacies is that it provided a momentum or, or a ability for us to have a more open, transparent dialogue about what's on people's minds. And of course, how are we going to be solutions, you know, drive solutions and not just talk about it. So again, that was kind of a long winded answer, but I feel like there's so many things now coming out of COVID that as, as uh, you know, leaders, we have to think about differently. Yeah. The only thing I think I would add is, and it's only relevant for digital related roles that can be, that can um, happen anywhere is that the talent pool is now global. Yeah. And yeah, that's that, right. that changes could change how some people think about yeah. hiring in the competition for. Yeah, no, I'm glad you said that it's a huge advantage and it can be a disadvantage. And yeah. so for us, I think we're just leaning into the ability to be more flexible and open, certainly about where we find our talent pool. So yeah. that's great. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I think we We've got time for maybe two more. I'm going to do one more in the virtual. We'll see how much time we have left. If we have okay. time, we'll go to the audience and then we'll come back to me for the final. Okay. Um, so it's hard to choose. There are, there are great questions here in in uh, the chat. Let's talk. Let's go to Megan's question, Megan Smith. Um, she's referring back to the comment you made earlier in the discussion about sales uh, that are in store still. And you can you can see the question here, but. What is the special sauce that creates the magical in-store experience with your retail associate that keeps coming back for more, right? What, what's, what's yeah. the secret? Well, I'd say it's a, it's a combination of, I kind of say this a lot, but kind of physical and emotional, right? So yeah. it starts with having, you know, we have about 13, a little over 1300 stores across the U S and first thing is, you know, I give credit to the founders that their real estate strategy was not to build in the middle of malls. And quite often you might not find us so much in downtown settings in big cities because the real estate's pretty expensive. We tend to be off mall and very accessible, you know, drive up, you've got Target, Nordstrom Rack, you know, Petco and Ulta Beauty, right? So, so we're kind of in an environment that you have to be accessible. You know, you have to make it easy for people. The store itself, you know, we build beautiful new stores all the time, but we also go back and reinvest in stores to make sure that they look really elevated and inviting. You know, having um, testers. I mean, during COVID, of course, we couldn't have any of that, but we're back to having environments where people can play with products and learn about the products. Um, having technology that now is pretty seamless, where you can scan, you know, QR codes and get information about products and even virtual try on. But then it's all about the people. Okay, I mean, that's kind of obvious, but it really is. You know, I remember I said the first change that I made at Ulta Beauty was to bring in uh, Jeff Childs, who had worked for me as the head of HR at US Cellular. And I brought him because I really knew we needed a great people leader with me. And it was kind of surprising to the board that that's the first move that I made. But I'm like, wait, we have like 25,000 people. And last time I checked, the vast majority of sales are happening in the stores, people to people. This is the most important thing, right? And it was the beginning of a journey for us to think about 
how do we really empower and engage uh, people that work in the stores? And so I would say we've got our a, a full service hair salon, you know, benefit brow bars, highly trained employees, but really part of the magic sauce is that we started to, well, it's a longer story that I know we have time, but I kind of realized at the beginning that really nobody was soliciting or encouraging people at our stores, our field management to really, you know, um, be, have it be in dialogue with executives. So we totally changed that and started to do market visits, which we continue to do, where we bring together as many general managers as can come in a two hour radius to just meet in the back room. It's not an inspection of the store. It's actually introspection. It's time to sit down and talk and listen to our associates and implement some of the ideas that they have. You know, when people have thoughts or questions, they usually have a solution already in mind. So when it's framed as a question, we would turn it into, well, tell me what you think. And frankly, the momentum that cre we created by actually respecting and listening to folks into implementing some of their ideas, I think became and is part of the magic sauce. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Is there a question in the audience that we want to, the, uh, the live audience at 1871 for the last one from, the, from, from you guys? Hi, uh, my name is Marcel. I, I was reading an article today that 20 to 30 percent of people, especially those in leadership, uh, experience imposter syndrome. And 70 percent of us in the professional world, especially women, have experienced imposter syndrome. So I, I was wondering if you, if you have a career, have you ever? Yes, um, you, cut, you cut off at the end, but I, I kind of got the gist of it. And I'm I'm assuming most people know that term, but I guess I don't know the technical definition, but the notion of kind of like, you know, why am I here? Do I deserve this? Did I really earn this? Can I be successful? The, the reason I say that is, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You Can we mute the um, audience at 1871, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Mary. Well, again, I'm sorry, you guys. It's a little hard to hear the exact questions, but I was surmising it was, you know, have I experienced that? And I guess at the end of the day, what I would say is, Absolutely. And I think part of the, especially, you know, even at the very beginning when I was at Quaker and I realized that I was the first person ever hired in this marketing training program that from an undergraduate, like we had an undergraduate program, but I was the first one that was hired that hadn't gone to like Princeton, Brown, Yale. I was the first one to go to Ivy League school. And I, I mean, that talk about imposter syndrome. When I figured that out a few months into it, I was like, oh, wow, I, I don't know what's happening here. Did they make a mistake? But I constantly just tried to bolster, you know, I used anybody remember this skit from Saturday Night Live years ago. You guys are all too young. Al Franken used to play this pop psychiatrist and he'd look in the mirror and say, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And gosh, darn it, people like me. I would literally have to give myself pep talks to say, OK, you know, I, I know that I'm being tough on myself. All I can do is do the best job I can do and develop great relationships with people and hopefully it'll be enough. And so I would say that notion of imposter syndrome, I'm no expert, but I think unfortunately it stays with us through many parts of life. And, and there's even times that I could experience that now. And I just would say, you know, if I look back, the one thing I wish I hadn't been is so hard on myself, you know, but I've learned now how to kind of push through that and exhibit more confidence or fake it till you make it with confidence. Um, but it's a tough one, it's a tough one. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I love the answer. This sometimes you have to tell yourself that in the mirror, you're not a hiring mistake, right? You do your power mm -hmm. poses, you do whatever you can to kind of pump up your confidence. I think we, I, and I, and I think that men do that too, just in different ways. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And I think, that, you know, as I got older and realized that other people felt this way, especially women, you know, and were able to share that with others, I think that that is helpful. All right. Unfortunately, we're at the end. It's hard to believe we it's, yeah. you know, through my last question for you, Mary, before we send you off with lots of applause and gratitude is, OK, you're sitting with your family. It's it's New Year's Eve 2022. So it's just so fast forward the clock, um, you know, nine, ten ish months. And you're thinking back on the year. What do you hope to be celebrating? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I would say, and not to, you know, state the obvious, but peace in Europe and Eastern Europe, I'm very deeply, I've been involved with Save the Children for many years. And uh, they, of course, are, you know, all yeah. hands on deck with this humanitarian crisis. So, 
you know, and on a personal front, I have my first wedding in our family, my first child, my not my oldest, my second daughter, Maggie, is getting married this summer in June. And she and Emily are going to get Thanks. married in Spain, which is where she's Emily is from. And I'm hoping that we'll just be celebrating a successful, you know, pulling off of a wedding and, a, you know, a great future for them. So, yeah. 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 And Spain can't beat that. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Exactly. Amazing. So please, everybody, um, let's turn the mic. Let's let's unmute the folks in person. Let's please join me in giving oh. Mary a huge round of applause. Oh. Mary, thank you so much for your. Hi, thank you, guys. I, I hope this was good. It was. Uh, it's a little tricky to do it this way. Hopefully, next time we'll do it in person, right? But I'm glad we could do it. All right, we'll talk to you soon. I hope. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your next workshop. Bye.